Good evening, Good everyone. Morning. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Kate Bruns, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Cabot Science Library, I am very excited to welcome you to our program tonight with Lee Smolin, discussing his latest book, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution, The Search for What Lies Beyond the Quantum. In just a moment, I'm going to turn things over to Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, physics and astronomy professor at the University of New Hampshire, who will be introducing the program tonight. But first, I would just like to say a little bit about this series and what else we have coming up this season. The Science Book Talk series features talks throughout the academic year by the authors of recently published books on a wide variety of science-related topics. Some of our recent talks have featured authors Sean Carroll, Karen Olson, and Randall Monroe in conversation with Kate Darling. On Tuesday, November 19th, next week, we will have the final event of our fall season when we host Naomi Oreskes for her latest book, Why Trust Science. We are already also well underway planning our spring season of events, so please stay tuned for updates on that. You can learn more about the series or learn more about Harvard Bookstore's other upcoming events by visiting us at harvard.com and signing up for our email newsletter. Uh, tonight's talk is going to be followed by some time for your questions, after which we'll have a book signing and refreshments in the Cabot Science Library just across the Science Center entryway. And if you haven't picked one up already, we'll have copies of Einstein's Unfinished Revolution for sale in the back of the hall and in the library as well. And as I always say, you have our thanks for buying books from Harvard Bookstore. Your purchases support this author series and they really, really do ensure the future of a local independent bookstore, so thank you. And finally, just one last reminder to silence your cell phones before the talk begins this evening. So now I'm very pleased to introduce Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, who was an undergraduate here at Harvard. Not only is she assistant professor of physics and astronomy at the University of New Hampshire, but she is also a core faculty member in women's studies there as well. Her research focuses on the intersection between particle physics, cosmology, and astrophysics. A columnist for New Scientist as well, Chanda has a book forthcoming in 2021 titled The Disordered Cosmos, Sex, Race, and Physics, a book we hope that we will be able to feature in this lecture series sometime in the near future. Please join me now in welcoming Chanda. So tonight I'm going to be introducing to you all uh, Dr. Lee Smolin. So he was my PhD advisor, and for that reason, I'd like to introduce him by telling you a little story. Um, when I was 23, I was in a top PhD program in astronomy. I was living by the beach in Santa Cruz, California, and I was convinced I wanted to do quantum gravity, but wanted nothing to do with string theory. So a mutual acquaintance, Stefan Alexander, who's here in the audience tonight, introduced me to Lee via email, and Lee invited me to come meet with him at his friend Jaron Lanier's house near Berkeley. We had a wonderful meeting, um, and then there was such a terrible storm, really just a terrible rainstorm, which honestly, as a Californian, I wish more of those on California, um, that we decided it wasn't safe for me to drive back to Santa Cruz that night. And so I stayed in a guest room. And that evening, while strumming a guitar, Lee said one of the most important things to me that anyone has ever said to me about being a physicist. He said, don't let anyone convince you that you can't be interested in other things, too. That was the first but not the last time that Lee encouraged me to understand that becoming a physicist means growing into a whole person with broad interests. And I think that the story is really emblematic because I think it shapes the way that he thinks about science and even the activities that he does, like writing um, the book that he's going to talk about tonight. So importantly, Lee doesn't fit the stereotype of a physicist in many ways. He's a high school dropout who went on to earn a bachelor's from Hampshire College in 1975 and a PhD here at Harvard in 1979. In the 1980s, he played a key role in the invention of loop quantum gravity a conceptually rich theory of quantum gravity that is researched around the world. And during the last four decades, he's con continued to advance research in loops. 
Importantly, Lee has been lucky enough to follow his scientific nose throughout his career, and he has endeavored to open doors for the next generation to do the same. So in that vein, Lee was a founding member of the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario, in Canada, which began as an experiment in giving physicists the space and the resources to think, unfettered by the sometimes overly restrictive demands of a traditional university. At Perimeter, Lee set an example of talking to people of all kinds and drawing from a variety of perspectives to try to make sense of the physical world, hosting not just physicists, but also philosophers and economists. Lee has also become a committed popular science communicator and public intellectual, who has authored several books for general audiences. When I was his PhD student, Lee was actually not super thrilled when I started blogging and actually discouraged it a little. Um, but if he wanted to succeed, he was setting the wrong, wrong example in his own practice as a scientist and writer. In fact, his book, The Trouble with Physics, which is a bit of a sociological analysis of how science operates in the physics community, planted the seeds that have blossomed into my own research on black women's social locations in physics and my writing for popular audiences, both about my research in particle physics and the sociological problems that particle, face, particle physics faces. Um, and those ideas will be in my forthcoming book, The Disordered Cosmos. Um, so that's partly your fault, Lee. Um, the title of that book comes from a paper that Lee and I wrote together about how non-locality could be used to explain the acceleration of the rate at which the cosmos is expanding. Tonight, we'll be hearing about Lee's latest book, Einstein's Unfinished Revolution, The Search for What Lies Beyond the Quantum, and, and I am happy to report that the concept of non-locality plays a key role in the text. In this new book, like my old favorite by him, Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, I really wanted to give that book a shout out. You should all get a copy. It's an exciting read, not just for non-experts, but also for people like me. In today's world of hyper-specialization and focus on commercial applications, it is easy to forget about the basic questions that draw us to activities like theoretical physics in the first place. Lee's writing is, an import is important, not just because it allows the wider community to become part of our journey as physicists to understand space-time's deepest mysteries, but also because it reminds physicists why we got involved in this sometimes very messy job in the first place. <laughs> One of my earliest conversations with Lee was about the measurement problem, a deep issue that goes to the heart of how well we understand physics at the most fundamental level, and one that I had never heard of, despite having a bachelor's degree and being well on my way to my master's in astronomy, until Lee asked me about it while driving from Toronto to Waterloo one evening. This marvelous new book, which I've really enjoyed, takes a deep dive into the measurement problem. So I hope you are intrigued. My excitement for those ideas I worked on a decade ago has certainly been restored. So with that, I'd like to welcome Lee Smolin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chanda. Wow, that's thrilling to hear. Chanda was an amazing student and is an amazing scientist, an amazing person. And that book, I'm sure, is going to be fabulous. Now, let me get the clicker so we can go forward. Now, this talk is partly about the book, but I want you to put it in the context. And the context is that fundamental physics now, in 2019, faces several parallel crises. Now, physics, the taking the laws of physics as far as we know them and applying them to materials, to the new quantum materials, to hosts of application is healthy. I don't want you to go away with the idea that I said that science isn't healthy or physics isn't healthy. But there are several questions, knotty questions, about which we have not in the years since I was a graduate student here, made progress. Made, we've made progress understanding the ideas we've had. And some of the ideas we've had have led to beautiful mathematical constructions. And we've had lots of fun. But there hasn't been a definitive 
advance in connecting fundamental our fundamental ideas of the principle of nature with experiment. And that's the background. Now, part of the reason, but only part of the reason why I got interested in writing the book, and the book is something that creeps in like a little mouse and it says, hi there, and you say, no, not this time, no more, never again. And then it's a cat, and then, anyway, you get the idea. Um, is to go back to Einstein's unfinished revolution and understand what worked and what didn't work and why it worked and why it didn't work. But the important thing, and by the way, this talk is multi-leveled. And I learned from my teachers, Sidney Coleman, Herb Bernstein, and others, how to give a multi-leveled talk. That is, it's to the non-scientists who are here from curiosity. And it's to the colleagues and friends who are scientists. And I have to say, it's a little bit to the ghost of Sidney Coleman who is my advisor here, all at once. But if there's something, some point that I don't clarify, please interrupt. That's our culture in physics. But just for short interruptions, then we'll have a discussion at the end. So the key thing to understand about the revolutionary half century that was at the beginning of the, 20th, the first half of the 20th century, roughly, and a bit beyond, is that Einstein initiated two revolutions in the same year, 1905. He initiated the relativity theory revolution, which 10 years later led to general relativity, which is not the subject of this talk, but is also a kind of ghost that will hang over this talk and the questions of the talk. General relativity is, of course, our best theory of space, time, gravity, and cosmology. And Einstein also was the first person to understand that we needed a new quantum theory. He was the first person to formulate the wave-particle duality and its mysteries. In the case of photons, there's the case of light. And this set off a development which led after about 20 years, a bit more, to the development of quantum mechanics, which I want you to distinguish when I say it from quantum physics. Quantum physics is the general study of quantum systems, that is fundamental systems of elementary particles, atoms, radiation, and things they make up. But quantum mechanics is the particular theory that Heisenberg and Schrodinger and their colleagues put into place in about 1927. So we have two revolutions. Why does the revolution remain incomplete? There are two reasons of concern here. One, they're unconnected. This is what I spent most of my career working on. That is to say, we have general relativity more or less like a classical mechanical theory describing the geometry of space and time and gravity and so forth. And we have a very different theory, quantum mechanics, applied to basically everything else. So we want to bring these together. When I throw a ball in the air, the atoms have physics, which is set out and stabilized by quantum mechanics, but the ball falls because of gravity. And we need to find a description. There's something we're missing in our understanding of nature, not to be able to put gravity and relativity and quantum mechanics definitively together. And I worked on this more or less starting when I arrived here as a graduate student, which Sidney didn't like. And <laughs> But he let me. And I started to develop some ideas where I stole some techniques from quantum field theory and gauge theories and applied them to the problem of quantizing gravity. And I got really lucky because nobody had tried that. So that's, that was just a stroke of luck. So I had a career. 
And I was, worked on several approaches to quantum gravity in many years, including string theory, causal dynamical triangulations, causal sets, energetic causal sets, loop quantum gravity, did I say string theory, spin four models, the whole, I've worked on all of them. And the conclusion that I come to is that they're all near misses. And nobody anticipated that. What we thought we were, we, of course, we were arrogant. We thought we're going to quantize gravity. How hard could it be? And we did in pieces in these many different ways, but none completely. None, first of all, that leads to any experimental verification, except for a few really dumb ones that got falsified. And that's the situation. So that's one reason the revolution remains incomplete. The other is that quantum mechanics makes no sense, basically. Look, let's be honest. Richard Feynman said, if we're honest, we'll have to agree that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And he was right. And quantum mechanics is beautiful. It has a mathematical structure and a conceptual structure of ideas that's breathtaking. You learn a whole different intuition of how to think about physical processes, bound states, scattering, excitations, all of which work marvelously in application. But as I'll explain, th there are questions of what the theory is really saying about the nature of physical reality, of fundamental, the world on a fundamental scale. So that I come to the conclusion as did Einstein and Schrodinger and de Broglie, among other inventors of the theory, that at best it's incomplete. And that's probably the right way to put it. Somebody said to me, they heard me say, and they said, you really mean it's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. It's incredibly helpful and useful and, it's, and inciting, but it's incomplete. That is, it doesn't give a complete description of what's going on in individual processes. And if we demand that high bar for our scientific understanding, it's incomplete. So it needs a completion. And that's the other reason. Uh, now, there's this funny subject called the interpretation of quantum mechanics, or the foundations of quantum mechanics. And People, not many people used to work on this, at least starting when I came in. And it's a very funny situation because the theory has a dozen or two dozen distinct readings, the literary people would say, or interpretations, which say very different things about nature. And that in itself is, to me, a measure of its incompleteness. If it allows itself to be talked about, so many different ways, which we could leave to the same experiments, understanding the same experiments and making the same calculations. It's underdetermined. It's underdetermining, as the philosophers would say, something about nature. Now, after I th was thinking already a lot about quantum mechanics, actually, since taking freshman quantum mechanics at Hampshire with Herb Bernstein, which, if I can introduce her, Katja Bradowicz, is has taken over that job as faculty at Hampshire College and is also the illustrator of the book. I've been worried about quantum mechanics and thinking about it. I chose not to go into it professionally. I mean, quantum gravity was already enough of a risk, but at least there were people who admitted to trying to work on it. So there's this funny subject of the interpretation, but I'm not interested. If you don't do it, please. But if you want to raise your hand and say, but what about the many worlds interpretation? Or what about the Copenhagen interpretation? Or what about the statistical interpretation? I'm not, but I basically, I'll be more polite when it's somebody specific. But what I basically feel is that is boring and done with. We don't want to interpret quantum mechanics we want to improve on it. We want to find the theory that tells the full story. 
Now, the main message I want to convey in this talk is that these two problems of quantum gravity and making sense of quantum mechanics are closely related. And the reason we haven't solved either one of them is we haven't considered and taken seriously enough the relationship between these two problems. Because I think they have a common resolution. And I'm going to try to point to it if I get that far by the end of the talk. Right. Now, the people talk about realism. And if I was a professional philosopher, which I sometimes pretend to be, but only when they're not in the room, um, I would give you some long definition of realism. But basically, realism means you're a realist if you believe that nature exists independent of our perception, existence, understanding, knowledge, intervention, et cetera. And if you're a realist, you believe that the point of doing all this work we do in science is to get a complete description and explanation of everything that's happening in nature. That's incredibly ambitious, but that's what we want if you're a realist. Not everybody is a realist. In fact, many of the people who develop quantum mechanics are not realists, or were not realists. And that's part of the story of the book, which I'm not going to touch on tonight. But it's an interesting story, is how the language and the, quote, interpretation of quantum mechanics that was mostly taught was invented by people who are very much anti-realists and how the history of the subject reflects that. But that's not the talk I'm giving tonight. If you want to hear that talk, find your nearest time machine, and I'll tell you where you can hear it. Or you can read the book. The point is that quantum mechanics itself is not a realist description. It does not give a complete description or in many cases, any description of what's going on in individual processes. So I think I said that. A property of a realist, when a realist talks about a physical system, they talk about variables or properties that just really exist. And to emphasize the difference, John Bell, who's one of the heroes of the subject, calls them beables. So I'll use that word. When I'm talking about properties which are created by our experiments, I'll call them observables. And I think that's standard language. Now, as I said, many of the inventors of quantum mechanics were not realists. And the first bunch of those got called Copenhagen physicists because they were surrounding Niels Bohr, who was a great mentor. And he had great charisma and built the first school of quantum mechanics. But many of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, including Albert Einstein, Louis de Broglie, who took the wave particle duality and applied it to matter, all matter, electrons, and all other particles, Erwin Schrodinger, who wrote the main equation that we'll be coming to for how quantum systems evolve in time, and a number of others were, were realists and were unhappy. And of those, there are three people at the bottom of the list who are still working. And they're great, but they're, they're unhappy. They have not managed to make, they've, let me make this point right at the beginning. There's no problem with making a realist version of quantum physics, which is isomorphic to quantum mechanics and gives exactly the same predictions. In fact, it was invented by Louis de Broglie a few months before Schrodinger wrote down the wave equation. And it's called the pilot wave theory. And even though Louis de Broglie was famous and had a Nobel Prize and all that for his applying the wave particle duality to matter, and even though he gave talks at all the important conferences, he was ignored, basically. And that theory was reinvented by David Bohm, who was a plasma physicist at Princeton. And that's a story that's also told in the book, but I'm not going to tell tonight. 
I think we said that. I'm not going to let you read the screen, but I'm just going to pause by saying that a lot of social theorists ask, does it matter that the fundamental theory of nature, that the core of, and I love that word core, I, for, from Sean, and it makes me think, are we all working out when we talk about the core theory? Sean Carroll decided that we should call the standard model the core theory. Sorry, that was supposed to be a joke. But anyway, um, if the fact that the core theory of nature is not realist and doesn't even try to give a description of what's going on in individual experiments, is that a problem for human culture? And we can debate that later. OK. So you may have come in here fully adapted quantum mechanics, but you may have come here as a rookie not having encountered quantum mechanics before. So the next 10 minutes, five or 10 minutes are for the latter group. I'm going to explain quantum mechanics, the basic principles of quantum mechanics in a few slides. And then we're going to go on. And the, the purpose of tonight's talk is to come back to this claim that quantum mechanics and quantum gravity have a lot to do with each other. And to show you, if you're not otherwise convinced that I'm nutty, some really adventurous, off-the-wall ideas about how to put them together. But we'll see if we get there. The first basic principle of quantum mechanics that you hear about is the uncertainty principle. I'll state it like this. If you make a list of everything you need to know to describe a system. For example, if it's a particle moving through this room, its position at some time, and its speed or velocity, or we usually, in physics world, talk about the momentum. Divide that list in two, and that's what quantum mechanics will let you measure and, or know or ascertain at any one time. You can only know or measure or ascertain half the information you would need to give a complete description of the system. That's what the uncertainty principle says. So right there, it tells you we're hiding stuff. And there's an equation that delta x delta p is greater than eight. I don't use many equations when I talked with the general public. But delta x is you try to make a measurement, and it's the accuracy of the measurement of position. Delta p is the accuracy of measurement of momentum. That is, if you measure the same state in the same way, the momentum value that you got would fluctuate. And delta p is the typical size of the fluctuations. And you multiply those together, and you get a number that, having left out some twos and pies, is greater than that number which is called Planck's constant. So that's, that's the uncertainty principle. Another basic principle is the superposition principle. There's something, when we give what quantum mechanics would call a complete description of a system, we say we've given the quantum state. And in quantum mechanics, we can do something weird with quantum states, which is add them. So if there's a quantum state A and a quantum state B, there's a quantum state A plus B. There's another one A minus B. There's another one A plus square root of minus 1 over 3 B. In fact, there's an infinite number of them of the form of some complex number A plus some complex number B. Now, that reminds us of waves because waves can be added. You can make two waves on the water, and they will add together and combine. And that's why we think of the wave-particle duality. We think that quantum states are something like waves that flow through a situation or uh, experiment, taking all possible routes. So that's the summary. The next principle I'm going to tell you about, and there's just two more, and then I'm going to draw some conclusions, and then I'm going to get a little crazier. Um, but this is good, right? It's review for everybody, at least. And you get to see the language I'm using. How quantum systems change in time. 
quantum Newtonian physics tells you that there are particles and they have position and momentum, and they evolve according to a law, which is called Newton's law of motion. And th that has several implications, and then you get three laws. But there's really just one law, which given the position and the velocity initially tells you, and given all the forces the particle is subject to, tells you how the particle will move. Quantum mechanics has two laws of motion. And that's the crime. That's the scene of the crime right there. The first is what you'd be familiar with. It acts most of the time. And it takes the quantum state, maybe visualizable as some waves, and just smoothly evolves it. And that's sometimes called the Schrodinger equation. I call it rule one. That's what's going on when we're not interacting with the system, when we're not making an intervention, when we're not, quote, measuring it. A characteristic of this law is it allows us to explore simultaneously different possibilities, whereas a particle would have to go around this path, or this path, or this path. The wave can explore all the possibilities together. And if I was really a good pedagogue, I would now give you a five minute aside based on that as to why quantum computers work. But I won't. <coughs> the other law refers only to measurement. And measurement means an explicit planned intervention in the system. So the observer is present in how the theory is talked about. And the second law or rule says if you make a measurement, if it interacts with some larger macroscopic system in such a way that there are several possible outcomes, and only one of those possible outcomes manifests itself. For example, we might look for the position of an electron that started out at this point right here and spread around the room. And we'd ask you to raise your hand if you found the electron. And only one person up there would find the electron. But in different meetings of the class, uh, everybody else would get to find an electron every once in a while. And this rule has a law about probability in it, which says that the probability to find an electron on your seat is proportional to the square of the wave in the region of your seat. And this, we're going to come back to it, is called the Born Rule. And it's the only part of the theory that mentions probabilities. But it ties probabilities essentially to the theory. The theory is hard to make sense of without probabilities, because they come, it comes in so necessarily there. So those are my two rules. The theory based on those principles and two rules has been extremely successful. I want to emphasize that. Over, it's not the first time I've said that. But because the concept of measurement is primary and the concept of probability is primary, it doesn't tell you, it doesn't give you, if you have a radioactive nuclei and you have a law that says that it has a certain probability to decay with unit time, the theory only tells you that. It does, not, it does not tell you when it will decay. And when it decays, it does not tell you why it decayed then, or what was different about it a moment before it actually decayed that made it decay in the next moment. It just allows you to compute a decay probability or a decay rate. And that's a way of stating what I'm concerned about. A theory that I would prefer as a realist would explain to me why the ones that decay at that time decayed at that time and not at this time. There would be some physical difference. To quote again a philosophical language, the philosopher Leibniz formulated the principle of sufficient reason that every question about why something happens now rather than later has a precise reason which explains it. And quantum mechanics does not satisfy the pr principle of sufficient reason. And that's a reason for some of us to think that it's incomplete and to want to complete it. 
and I'm going to skip the next slide. Um, a measurement device is a physical system. So why can't we take rule one and work out what happens when we make a measurement? Why do we even need rule two? And there is the beginning of a long tale of people attempting to derive rule two from rule one. And guess what? That's really hard to do because rule one doesn't have any mention of probability. So you have to somehow sneak in through the back a notion of probability. So there's a long list of attempts in the history of the subject to derive rule two from rule one. And to my knowledge, they fail. Hence the Schrodinger cat paradox. And hence the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, if somebody wants to ask me about that. So that's my conclusion. Quantum mechanics fails to give us what a realist would want. And so let's see how hard it would be to make a realist theory. Now, I can see I'm having a problem with time, but so be it. I have, as you know, a problem with time. Um, here's the big clue that ties it to quantum gravity. And it's non-locality and entanglement, which are closely related ideas. Whoa, I'm going the wrong direction. I told you that the uncertainty principle says that if you have a system, you can make a quantum state that makes definite or sharp half the information you need to understand that system. But consider this. Consider that we take a system of two particles, particle A and particle B, and we interact them with each other. They perform some interaction. Then they separate. Then it turns out that there are quantum states for which the total state of particle A plus particle B is in a state where there is a definite property shared by A and B, but A and B individually have no definite properties. And one of these states I'll call contrary. And it is a state where you pick any property and you measure particle A and you measure the same, particle, the same property for particle B and you'll get opposite answers every time you're in that state. But the chances of getting any particular answer from particle A alone are completely random. There's no information in the state about particle A by itself, only about how they're anti-correlated. So that we call entanglement. And that was Einstein's last contribution to quantum mechanics in 1935, was the discovery of that property. Now, Einstein discovered that in a paper that he believed proved that quantum mechanics was incomplete. And so I'm going to show you that argument. He, first of all, gave a criteria for reality. The criteria, and I quote it, and this paper had a huge influence on me when I was an undergraduate. I read it in that class, that freshman quantum mechanics class we were talking about. Criteria for reality, if without disturbing a system B, you can predict with certainty probability one, what will be the value of a property P for that system, then P must be an element of physical reality. In other words, without touching that system, you know enough about it to predict with probability one what the outcome of some intervention or measurement would be. Then there must be something real, physically real, about that property. That's Einstein's assumption. Apply that to an entangled pair in the state contrary I told you about. Measure the momentum of A, get P. Then you know with certainty what the momentum of particle B is. It's the opposite. And you know that with certainty. It satisfies the criteria. Therefore, the momentum of particle B 
is real. It's something that you can know the value of without intervening with the system. But you could instead have chosen to measure the position of a particle A and get the answer. And then you know with certainty that the position of particle B is the reflection of that. So you know that with certainty. So that satisfies the criteria too. But quantum mechanics can't describe a system in which both the position and the momentum of a particle are definite. But I've proven to you that they satisfy both Einstein's definition of reality. Therefore, quantum mechanics gives an incomplete characterization of reality. That was the einstein podolsky rosen argument. It's beautiful. It's wrong. Does anybody know why it's wrong? Not professionals. Well, it says it here. Um, the assumption was without disturbing a system. But the assumption is locally. Niels Bohr came back and he said, but when you measure particle A, that measurement has an effect on particle B. It's just communicated in a very strange way. In order to make his argument work, Einstein has to assume that an influence can only be spread locally. That is, you can only influence things by touching them or pushing on them or sending a pulse of a field which pushes on them. That's the principle of locality. Now, Einstein didn't know it. But that principle, in the way that I stated it, is false. And that was discovered experimentally by experimentalists, including somebody who was working here when I was a PhD student. John Clauser, I think his name was, um, who was trying to do this experiment. John Bell makes a definition of locality which is sim similar to Einstein's, a bit different. He says, supposing that I have the same setup and I have the possibility of choosing to measure the momentum here or the position. Let me assume that whatever is real about particle B doesn't depend on what choice these observers over here make on what to measure on particle A. That certainly fits our naive definition of locality. John Bell was able to formulate that condition mathematically and prove that such a system would have a certain limitation on correlations, on functions of correlations between different measurements, which I'm not going to bother you to show you the details of. But it's elementary. Bell's theorem makes almost no assumption besides the one I mentioned, and that probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. And the experimentalists were able to test that inequality on correlations and found that the assumption is violated, which, by the way, you can just do a calculation and you can show that quantum mechanics violates the assumption. So quantum mechanics itself doesn't respect locality. The experiment took some time to get right. It wasn't, done, it wasn't right in the PhD experiment as it was done here. And I, I was taken down in the basement. I'm trying to remember who. But somebody took me down into the basement and showed me the apparatus that got the wrong answer. But beginning with ASPE and collaborators in 1982, they tuned it well enough to get the right answer. And by now, this is known to disagree. That is, the assumption of locality is known to disagree with experiment by 25 sigma or something like that. It's a very impressive disagreement. Hence, Bell locality is false, which means you can affect the value of a property at B by the choice of what you choose to measure at x. And hence, any completion of quantum mechanics that does what it's supposed to do and give 
a, just a detailed description of what exactly happens has to have an explicit interaction between these far separated points. And this has been now tested by the Vienna people between a system on Earth and one in the satellite. I think Japanese or Chinese or both have also tested this theorem between the Earth and Earth's orbit. So locality is not, that first of all should shock, if you haven't heard that before, that should sh shake you up. Because that means that space is not fundamental. That there's a deeper level of description. If you want to be a realist about quantum theory, you have to believe that there's a deeper level of description where locality is not fundamental. If the locality is not fundamental, it must be emergent. So there must be a story about how space emerges. And locality must be an aspect of the properties of that emergent structure, which we call space. And hence, non-locality is emergent. And hence, the distinction between them is emergent. But then we're talking about the quantum physics of space. And that's on the territory of quantum gravity. So that's why the problem is linked to quantum gravity. Now, I think somebody wiser than me tell me whether, do I keep going or can I stop? Or can, I want to keep going. Somebody, what? I have more time. Brilliant. I like whoever that was. Thank you. That was the right answer. Now, let's come back to the problem of making a realist description of quantum physics. I mentioned that there is the pilot wave theory of de Broglie and Bohm. This basically says, to remove the mystery, there's a wave and there's a particle. And the wave flows through the system, and it tells the particle how to move. The particle doesn't feel the usual forces. The particle just feels, it just follows the gradient of the phase of the wave function, to say, say something technical for the physicist. And the waves interact according to the Hamiltonian or action principle of the system. So there are several versions of that. Um, I, can, I have lots of slides about it if you want to ask about it. There's another approach that many people work on called dynamical collapse, where you combine the two rules and you make the theory nonlinear so that the, 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 I haven't mentioned collapse of the wave function, but how the wave function, when you measure it, goes to a definite classical value is something which happens dynamically. There's a law of motion which describes how it happens. And most models of that kind, famously one by Roger Penrose, involve gravity in some sense. The wave functions go nonlinear, the dynamics goes nonlinear when the gravitational potential energy of the system becomes appreciable. So those are things that make us think there's a relation to quantum gravity. Now, if I've got you for a few more minutes, I'm going to talk about a new approach to make a theory which gives a realist approach to quantum mechanics and solves, hopefully, or addresses quantum gravity. And this has been work over many years. I just want to tell you in the five or so minutes I have some of the basic concepts. The first concept is relational. So I'm going to teach you a lot of philosophy and physics in five minutes. Newton invented mechanics, but he had a fierce rival who was Leibniz, who was a mathematician who also invented calculus and also was very interested in motion and dynamics. And Leibniz opposed Newton's theory because it depended on a notion of absolute position and absolute motion through absolute space, meaning that what Newton meant by where is a particle or how is a particle moving means it's defined with respect to some fixed reference 
which is just part of the world. It doesn't satisfy any laws. There's no reason it's there, but there's just this fixed notion of at rest. Of course, Newton was a very religious fellow, and this for him was, the, was what God perceived. And there was also a clock of God. So the T in the equations was T as measured by this perfect clock of God. Leibniz said, what are you, crazy? Nobody can observe absolute position or absolute time. We only can observe relative position, where I am relative to that clock, what my clock says relative to that clock, etc." And so Leibniz argued that a rational physics in which all the questions could be answered, remember his principle of sufficient reason, would be one where all the notions of position and space and all the notions of time were based on relationships. So I've tried, and a few other people have tried, to make completions of quantum mechanics that are relational. Because the notion of space and time in ordinary quantum mechanics is really inherited from Newton. The notion of relational space and time that Leibniz advocated was developed by Einstein. And that's the basic reason why general relativity was invented and succeeded. It's a completely relational description of space and time. Let me mention several principles of relationalism. And then we'll apply them very quickly. And then I'll come to my conclusion. Leibniz talked about the principle of the identity of the indiscernible. And let's apply this to us individually. The idea was what identifies an object or an event. And in Newton's kind of physics, objects and events are identified externally by where they are what their address is in this absolute space and what time it is with respect to this absolute time. The idea of the identity of the indiscernible is the opposite. First of all, there's the idea that your location is not external to you. It's what you see when you look around. And this is the most important idea in this talk. In other words, what is your view? You open your eyes and you see a view, which if you remember your relativity, is light coming up to your backward light cone. And this view is what situates you in the universe. So we turn things around and we think of views your view of the world is what identifies your relationship to the world. You, Leibniz had a beautiful little paragraph that you can turn into a poem in which he talks about somebody in a city. And you live here in Cambridge or Boston. And you have a set of lives. You have a life which interlakes your family, who you work with, friends, who you buy stuff with, and your neighbors. And that's your view of the city. It's incomplete, but it's particular to you. And the whole set of views together defines the city without any one of them being complete. And this is the concept. A universe described, a single universe described by a multiplicity of views. Now, what it means, the identity of the indiscernible, is that they're unique. Every single view is unique. If there are two that are the same, that have the same relation to the rest of the universe, they're the same thing. They're not two things which are identical. They're the same thing. So that's another way of saying the principles of relationalism. Another thing that this means is that this is for the physicists in the audience. There are no global symmetries. And there are no global conservation laws. And I can explain why later if somebody asks me. But indeed, it's a theorem in general relativity with the cosmological closed boundary conditions that there are no symmetries. 
that is, there are no symmetries on the space of solutions. Um, this is why some of us make a big fuss about fundamental theories being background independent. A background is some structure which sits in your theory like absolute space and is a reference for everything else. And I think we should read these structures as pointers or hooks to reference systems outside the system that we're describing in our theoretical model. The, cl the claim is that a fundamental theory should have no hooks to something outside the universe. The universe should be unique and complete in that every aspect of it is not sitting there frozen, but has some history and has some dynamics. OK. Now, let me just present a fantasy. Supposing that the universe, and now, and if you let me talk for another half an hour, which I won't, I can fill in the details of this. But this is just the, the vision which I'll end on. Supposing the universe is composed of nothing but partial views of itself from all the events that happen. And that's all there is. That's the beables, is each event is some congruence or meeting of energy and other conserved quantities, and locally, locally conserved quantities. And every event is unique, and every event has a view, which is basically the information or the fields coming up its past light cone. And the universe is nothing but that. There's not the universe and then descriptions of it in terms of what's seen from different points of view. There is just what's seen from different points of view. And supposing that I could write a dynamics that could measure the difference between two views and that acted to maximize the diversity of the views in the history of the universe. And then suppose that taking that as a definition of dynamics, it's a function called the variety. The maximization of the variety would correspond after some string of assumptions and simplifications, blah, 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 to recovering de Broglie and Bohm's version of quantum mechanics. That would be a different universe to wake up in. Thank you. Thank you. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll be Melissa and I will be bringing mics around the audience. I have heard that probability in quantum. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I have heard that probability in quantum physics is not the same as our probability. What is your opinion about it? The use of probability in quantum mechanics is a long technical subject in philosophy of physics, so much so that re related to just the many worlds interpretation, which is where there's a lot of discussion of the meaning of probabilities. It took me two chapters of this book just to present in a relatively clear way. It's not. The notion of probability in quantum theory is not simple. And the intricacies when you, get, when you try to formulate something like the many worlds interpretation, which I'm not interested in, as I said, but I have good friends who are interested in it. And the toughest, most subtle issues have to do with the notion of probability. And I'll just give you one reason why. If you ha like this idea of many worlds and the splitting every time you do an experiment, the universe splits into different branches, each one for a different value of the result of the experiment, then there's a branch 
that pick any value for the result, there's a branch that sees that value with probability one. And for every possible value, there's a branch that sees it with probability one. Not only that, there's an infinite number of branches which see that answer with probability one. So it's, it's subtle. And if you like that kind of intellectual puzzle, I recommend, I recommend there's a book by David Wallace, which is very good to help you get into it. I'm sorry, I know I didn't answer your question. <laughs> David Wallace was, uh, was in the group at Oxford, which was the strongest group in the world in philosophy of physics for some years. And he's now gone to University of Southern California. So, so can I ask a question? Yes. Is this last part in your book? Yes. Oh. Just. Um, a very simple question, maybe too simple. You said a fundamental theory should be background independent. For example, no absolute space. Does background independent mean it can't rely on mathematics or on causality? No. Um, absolutely not. First of all, if I took a more careful stroll through the theory that I'm implicitly referring to at the end, which I should give it some names. It's called The Causal Theory of Views. And it's in a paper called The Dynamics of Difference. And it's a merging of two series of papers, one with Marina Cortez on energetic causal sets, and one series of papers called The Real Ensemble Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics. So that's where you find the details. And we use lots of mathematics. Of course, we use mathematics is, is a tool. And of course, you use it as best you can. And we, you might choose differently. But if you want to make a realist description, the whole, you're trying to answer the question, what's fundamental and what's emergent? There's no shame in being emergent. I mean, temperature is emergent, pressure is emergent, you know, density viscosity, conductivity, all of these are emergent quantities, but they're perfectly real. They're just not part of the, fundament, the most fundamental description. And we posit in these models that causality is part of the fundamental description. Uh, thank you for the talk. So thank this you. interesting hypothesis, the space is not fundamental, uh, but, but these other quantities like, you know, time is intertwined with space and relativity, causality, energy, momentum, all depend on space in their traditional definition. So it seems to me if you follow this hypothesis, you would have to, be re you would have to redefine pretty much all of physics or the vast majority of it. Uh, it's almost yeah, like you're tearing well, down the whole... <laughs> well, this, is, this is why it took years. <laughs> Right, so uh, and it's, I, it's a know, very... I've, I've done lots of work during these years which got published, and this was a series of things that also got published, but the, where they were building up to was, we, you know, we didn't put our necks too much on the line. We, we kept it slow and we developed it until we were confident of it. But seriously, um, usually you start with, a, can I, will, will anybody be upset if I use one technical argument? From physics. There's a theorem called Nether's theorem that says, named by after Emmy Nether, that says that if you have a symmetry in a physical system, there's a, con a, con a continuous symmetry, there's a conserved quantity related to it. And it's a very fundamental and important theorem. If we don't have space, if space is emergent, but in that level that's fundamental, we posit we have momentum and energy, which is exactly what we do. We don't base that on Nevis theorem. We say it's fundamental. It's part of what's assumed is fundamental. We have the opportunity to look for an inverse Nevis theorem. And that's part of the ma mathematical mechanics whereby we get space to emerge in some cases. Any experimental clues or probes into this? The, important, the most important experimental probe into quantum gravity asked the question of whether Lorentz invariance, which is a fundamental symmetry of the elementary particles, is really fundamental. And you can 
quantum gravity has an energy scale, which is the Planck energy. So you want to know if you can test violations of Lorentz invariance at order energy over the Planck energy or energy over the Planck energy squared. That sounds like that should be impossible. That's you know, 30 orders of magnitude off atomic physics scale. So how could you do that? It turns out you can do that if you have gamma ray bursts that travel for on the order of a billion light years before they arrive on Earth. And you can ask about the separation. You imagine an uh, infrared photon and a uh, 50 GeV photon, which are produced in the same burst and travel for 10 billion years before they're detected both by the Fermi satellite. And something on order of energy over the Planck energy becomes a few seconds of delay for one of them over the 10 billion light years. It, it's a joy when you first do that calculation and versions of it, and you see that there's a hope. And that's why when I wrote the Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, I had a lot of hope for experimentally checking Lorentz invariance. So it's been checked at order energy. Lorentz invariance status has been checked at order energy over Planck energy. And it's not seen. And that's a drastic clue. It's not what we would like. We would like order energy over Planck energy squared or higher, but at least squared. Because the only models that have violation at order energy rather than order energy squared also break parity. And it would be more conclusive if there were models that didn't break parity. So anyway, that's the best, that's the best we have so far for, for real experiments. And as I hinted at, it did, there were lots of people who had publications that were falsified by those observations, including me. We were very happily looking forward to the breakdown of Lorentz and Lorentz. So we have time for two more questions, and then after the questions, it's total fun time with cheese cubes <laughs> in the <laughs> library. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, Th thanks for the inspiring talk. Could you please, uh, I'm a little bit confused. What do you mean by locality emerges, but it will be disordered? What is disorder locality? Oh, and I, why, I, if it is disordered, no locality emerges as well? I, I'm really confused on, on this statement. Right, because I didn't even say it, let alone explain it. Well, since it's written. So disordered locality is a name that Fotini Marco Pulo gave to a possible phenomenon. And I'll describe it as succinctly as I can. In a large class of models of quantum spacetime, like spin foam models you may have heard of, or causal dynamical triangulation models, there is a graph which basically behaves like quantized electric fields in quantum chromodynamics. It's a graph of fluxes of quantized electric fields. Only the electric field is related to the gravitational field, and the flux is related to the area. And you have a graph. The quantum description of geometry is some complicated graph with intersections on the order of a Planck scale, a Planck length apart. But Fotini noticed, and the fact that it's, if you take something that looks like a regular lattice or a slightly disordered lattice, it looks local in the sense that it, it defines an average spatial geometry. And the connections through the graph make jumps of about the Planck length. You still will generate violations of Lorentz invariance, which counter the measurements I just made. But she, we didn't know that at the time. This is the mid-90s, late 90s. So Fotini said, but wait a minute. This is just a graph. So I can take a, a point over here and a point 20 light years over there and connect them. And that's a defect, to use terminology coming from condensed matter physics, that's a defect that is conserved. No local interaction can get rid of that defect. It can move it around a bit here and here. So that's what we mean by disordered locality. And there was a 
period when a lot of people, you know, some people, studied whether that was a, a problem for the theory. And the paper that Chanda mentioned that she and I did together was trying to find a good use for that by turning it into dark energy, of course. And where is Chanda? Were we foolish? Foolish. Yeah, I did too. So did I answer that? That's an example. Oh, um, I have a question. Um, you know, space is emerging as this collective organization of these fundamental relationships. And I'm wondering, um, by the way, this is like very much like Immanuel Kant thought a little bit like this. But I wonder about time. Are these relationships like somehow changing? Is it, does time somehow emerge from this? or? Have you thought of a way to, to um, um, consider time differently from um, Newton and his one god and his time clock? And are you thinking of different types of time? Is there like an entropy time? Is there, are there sort of time relative to individual processes? I was just wondering if you thought about time. Uh, <laughs> I know you thought about the time of the talk ending, but I mean. No, uh, I. <laughs> I'm sorry. I. Uh, um, <laughs> two of the books that I've ha had the bad judgment or whatever to get involved in writing are about the subject ex exclusively of the nature of time. One by myself and one in a wonderful collaboration with Roberto Mangibera Unger, who's a professor of law here and a very wonderful philosopher. So I have spent lots of time thinking about various issues related to the nature of time. So I should look at your, um, look at the but books you've written me. about. Time. Not only me, it's a central question. So, you know, somebody said to me, do you want to write some essay on, well, actually, I'm not going to go there. Um, there are a lot of people who are thinking about the issue of the nature of time in quantum gravity and cosmology. My dear friend, Carlo Rivelli, has a book out just last year about time. Um, you can find lots of, if you look up time and almost anything in Quantum Magazine, which is a, a pretty good popular magazine online, you'll find lots of things. So the question is, or among the questions are, is what is the nature of, the, of reality? Is reality in the present so that the past was real, the present is real, and the future is not yet real? Can we talk like that? Yeah. Well, if we can talk like that, we violate relativity. Mm -hmm. Due to an argument, it's so nice to reference people here, but by Hilary Putnam originally, who was a professor of philosophy here. Um, and do you care is then the question. Do you, care, do you violate relativity in a way that matters? And that's a question a lot of us debate. And how, what does that say for cosmology and people who are wondering about the origin of the universe? Yes. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes, I, uh, I, we have lots of fun. But one of the basic questions in the quantum theory of gravity is, is the Big Bang, in general relativity, Big Bang, the Big Bang is the first moment of time. It's a singularity where the curvature and energy momentum are infinite, and the universe develops and evolves from there. In the quantum theory, does that, do you get rid of that singularity? And is there an evolution coming from the past? Many of us think yes. Can anything survive that passage that we could observe? Roger Penrose thinks yes. And that's very controversial. Um, so there's a lot of thought exactly about these these, these issues. So it, I like ending on something controversial. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, did I say something controversial? No, no, you said the word controversial. I'll let you go, <laughs> go ahead. It was a joke. It was a joke. Uh, let's thank Lee Smolin again for a beautiful talk. Thank you.